Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel where we talk about Hungarian true crime cases, murder, mystery and conspiracies. So if you like this kind of content, don't forget to like this video, comment, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. Today we are going to talk about the Hungarian Lady Dracula Battery LG Bat. And Bailey Sarian made a video about this story some months ago, which got 3.6 million views as of right now. Bailey, if you are watching, I love you. I really do. But you just got so many things wrong that I have this Hungarian responsibility to let the world know about the truth. Let's just get into this, right? So Báthori Erzsébet was born into the most noble family of Hungary. She was born on the 7th of August in 1560 in the city of Nyirbátor. Now, researching these kind of cases for me is always so weird because I have a family everywhere and my sister-in-law is from Nyirbátor and it's a very nice place. It's famous for its food and spirits. Anyway, Erzsébet grew up in this very noble family, the Báthori family. And yes, her parents were distant relatives, but not first-degree cousins, okay? You see, this Báthori family was so old that over the centuries it broke down into two main branches. And her parents were from the two op opposite branches of this family, so they were cousins several times removed which was okay then and it is actually okay now. In Hungary, you can marry your third degree cousin. It's actually much further than you may think. It sounds like it's close family, but it's not. She grew up in the castle of Eced and all of her family was very influential and royal. On her father's side, one of her uncles was Bátori Miklós, who was the national judge, aka the judge of Hungary. And her other uncle on her father's side was Báthori András, who was the Vévod of Transylvania, remembering that Transylvania was part of royal Hungary, and Vévod is second to the prince of Transylvania. On her mother's side, her uncle was Báthori István, who was the king of Poland, as well as the prince of Transylvania. So all of her family ruled over Transylvania, Poland and Hungary as well. Because of her high status, she was forced to always behave like a lady, of course. However, she exhibited um, aggressive behavior, she had anger management issues, and she also suffered from mysterious seizures that we guess is epilepsy, and she also had migraines. Not only that, when she was a child, she witnessed a very brutal execution. You see, the executioner opened, cut open the belly of a live horse, took out its organs and stuffed a live man, the criminal, inside the belly of the horse. Then stitched the belly back up and watched as both the horse and the man died a terrible death. Which is, I'm um, just poor horse. Imagine seeing this as a child, of course you are going to have severe trauma. Jesus, that was brutal even for the Middle Ages. Now, of course, coming from her nobility, she had to have an arranged marriage. Now, this marriage was in the making since she was 10 years old, and when she was 15, she married a man, Count Nadas de Ferenc, who was 20 years old. Their wedding was on the 8th of May in 1578 and her wedding present was nothing less than a castle of Chaite with 12 surrounding villages around it. Her husband was fighting the Ottomans in a 15-year-long war. You see, the Ottomans were trying to invade Hungary for a very long time, which they eventually succeeded in, but that's another story. So her husband was almost always away, so she lived in this castle all by herself, essentially. They had five children called Anna, Orsoya, Kato, Andras, and Pal, so three girls and two sons, and uh, only three of them survived infancy. Her husband was also rumored to be a very brutal man. You see, whenever they would capture an Ottoman soldier, he would torture them by placing pieces of paper between their toes and then light the paper on fire, which is a very original way of torturing someone, that's for sure. So as I said, Erzsébet was living at home with her kids and her servants in this big-ass castle, but without her husband for the most part. Now, some sources said that they were in an abusive marriage, that he was abusive to her. 
and this is what led to her in alleged insanity later on. However, I question if her husband was almost always at battle, how could have he been so abusive to her for such a long time that it had a bad enough impact on her that she would go insane? Like if he was almost never home, could have he been so abusive as some sources say? So this has been debunked essentially. It just doesn't make sense logically. They were married for almost 30 years and no, her husband most likely did not die of a sickness. You see, he was always at war. He had lots of injuries and he got a lot of sicknesses along the way. So eventually he just got too weak and then died one day of, her, of his injuries. Now with the death of her husband, she inherited everything. Hundreds of thousands of acres of land, many castles, villages, um, all the money, everything. She inherited everything. So she became a very powerful, strong woman. In fact, one of the most powerful women in the country. She was also a very cruel woman. You see, she would beat and hurt her servants and maids all the time. One day, one of her maids was brushing her hair for her and the maid accidentally pulled on her hair a bit too much which angered Ajebet so much that she punched the maid in the face and a single drop of blood fell on Ajebet's skin. And when she saw how young and plump and white and fresh looking her skin became under the drop of blood, she figured it would be best to bathe in the blood of virgin girls to keep her looking young. I guess she did not hear about tretinoin and sunscreen yet. Conveniently, she had a dozen villages to get some girls. So what she did is that she coaxed many girls into her castle to work there as her maids and as her servants, which was much better than working on the plantation, on the field, on the hot sun. So these girls went there under this false belief that they would have a better life with the countess. But what she did instead, is she closed these young girls into cages made of thorns. She would pierce nails and needles under these girls' fingernails into their skin, into their eyes. She would burn their hands with hot metal coins and keys and metal bars. She would rip out their fingernails one by one. She would cut off their breasts with pliers. When a victim has become too weak, she would smear honey on their bodies and chase them out on the meadow so that bees would come and sting these girls to death. Or in winter, she would strip them naked and toss them out in the meter high snow and splash cold water on them so they would freeze to death. With the virgin girls, she would hang them upside down above a bathtub. She would slip their throats and let them bleed to death and then drain them from their blood in which she would bathe and drink the blood. She would cut off pieces of their flesh and she would eat it raw. Not only that, but she used black magic to fight her enemies, the Ottomans and the peasants in their uprisings. So she would get black chickens and bludgeon them to death and then splatter the chickens' blood all over the ground. And this is how she would conjure black magic. She was famous all over Europe for her unsatisfiable libido that it, nobody could satisfy her sexual desires, no men no woman, no child, and no animal. And on top of that, every time one of her servants made the tiniest mistake, she would execute them on the spot and she would murder them in terrible ways. She was an absolute terror. She was a nightmare and all of her servants lived in fear around her. Finally, her secret got out because one day her two sons-in-law went over to her house, to her castle, and caught her red-handed. When they walked in on her room, they saw the bodies of her most recent victims, and she was committing one of her brutal crimes. She was bathing in the blood of the young girls when they walked in on her. So the men of the two sons-in-law arrested her right away. So the two men called the Palatine of Hungary called Torzó György, and Palatine is second to the king. 
and they started an investigation on her on the 29th of December in 1610. Many, many people, hundreds of people came forward testifying against her, saying that there were mysterious deaths and kidnappings and disappearances in the villages, and anybody who went to work in her castle were never seen again. Her closest servants also testified that they were in on these crimes with her, so those servants were killed on the spot as their punishment. And the Palatine of Hungary decided that she should be imprisoned in her own castle, so they chose a windowless room and they walled her inside and made this very tiny cell for her. And they only left a tiny hole on the wall through which they could give her food or feed her. And she lived there for four years when she became very deficient, sick and weak, and she finally died on the 21st of August in 1614. She had more than 600 victims. And I'm sorry that I have to break the news to you, but this was all a lie. None of this is true. This is all fabricated. I'm sorry, Bailey. None of this is true. Okay, so you may be confused as to how this happened or why. First of all, there was absolutely no mention of this blood-sucking, cannibalistic vampire witchcraft until a more than a hundred years later in 1729. That was when the first written stories emerged of her in forms of legends. The contemporary witness testimonies did not mention anything about these crimes. Those only mentioned that she was abusive to her servants and that she would occasionally beat the servants or the maids. Now, that sounds bad enough today. Of course, you shouldn't beat or abuse your, your employees whatsoever. But 500 years ago, that was the norm. A noble person was in their right to beat their servants as a form of punishment. So even if that is true, even of those fake extracted testimonies were true to begin with, she, was, she wouldn't have been any worse than anybody else at her time. But there is evidence to show that those witness testimonies were not true to begin with. You see, the Palatine and the two sons of law captured these hundreds of peasants that worked on the lands in her villages and they tortured them until they were willing to testify against her. And remember when I said that her four closest servants were killed on the spot? That's because they had evidence for her that would have saved her ass. And Erzsébet herself was never questioned and she was never given a fair trial. Now why was she not given a fair trial? Because as a noble person, she couldn't have gone on trial without a questioning. But if they questioned her, they would have uncovered the truth that all of these allegations were fabricated and that she was framed. All right, so all of her servants were killed. People were tortured to testify against her. She was not questioned and she was not given a chance to defend herself. Why, you may ask? Well, the reason to that is that the Palatine and her two sons-in-law conspired against her. Remember when I said that she became the strongest and most powerful woman in Hungary? That she had hundreds of thousands of acres of land, she had dozens of villages and several castles and all the money and all the titles and the rights? Well, they did not want her to have that. Because a strong, intelligent, independent, educated, powerful woman is the downfall of men. And these men figured that if this woman had all of these things that could have only been the direct result of her being a murderer, torturer, vampire, witch. Of course, makes perfect sense, because these men just could not believe or accept that women could be of status as well. So they made this elaborate plan against her to bring her down, to ruin her, to ruin her reputation so that they would have an excuse to imprison her. And by the time she died, these three men already divided all of her possessions between themselves. Not only is there absolutely no historical evidence of her being this brutal, cannibalistic blood countess, there is evidence of the opposite. She was extremely charitable. She was a devout Christian. She ran her own hospital in her castle. She ran the first girls' school of Europe in her castle. 
she sponsored students to go abroad to study at foreign universities and she took in the widowed wives and the orphaned children of the men who died in battle against the Ottomans. She was everything that a woman wants to be, but men don't want her to be. She was educated, she was literate, she spoke many languages, she had rights, she had titles, she had ranks, she had land, plantations, castles, villages, she had everything, and the man just wanted to ruin her and take all of these things from her. This is the end of this story. And if you heard about it for the first time from Bailey, then I'm sorry that I had to ruin it for you. But this is the truth. Honestly, the truth is never nearly as interesting as a legend. So let me know what you think of this story. Do you have any information to add or do you have any questions? You should ask that in the comment section down below. If you want to see more videos like this, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you don't miss my next upload. And I see you next time. Bye!